Okay. So cool. So here we are. Uh, I'm chatting with Ms. Morgan Usini. Hello. Hello. And uh, so Morgan and I kind of go back. I got some of our paraphernalia to nice. the Cornell <laughs> days, right? I got this guy that, was, hey. that I still have. Still fits. That's good. That, that's right. I haven't, uh, I haven't put on much weight since those days. Um, and uh, so we're going to we're talking about your career in athletics as a professional athlete. And so I thought maybe, uh, you know, just give us a summary. I mean, I've read about you and you're on Wikipedia and you're all over YouTube and stuff. So anybody can find stuff about Morgan online. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe just a quick summary of the career, maybe starting from college to how did it all happen? Sure. Yeah. So starting in college, I guess, you know, I um, my freshman year, my first year in college, was a pretty rough year. I took um, a lot of time, I guess, adjusting to a new lifestyle and didn't perform very well. So I didn't even make the varsity team my freshman year at Cornell. And then during the summer, you know, I kind of refocused and came back um, more committed to the sport. And then I made the varsity team my sophomore year. And then from there, you know, became a multi-time All-American, went to the national championships with some fellow, you know, Cornellian teammates. Um, and then at the end of Cornell, when I graduated, I was fortunate enough to get um, a small contract with Reebok, which is a, a running shoe company. Um, and it wasn't for very much, but it was enough that I could at least pursue my dream. And I still, you know, just slowly every year got a little bit better was making small improvements. Um, I, after my three-year contract with Reebok, I then got like a better contract with Adidas. And Adidas is who I ran for for the rest of my career. So I think that was like about six more years after my three years. So I ran professionally in total nine years. Um, and during that time, you know, I, um, I made the U.S. Olympic team. I made the U.S. World Championship team. And those were in 2011 and 2012. Um, and I'd say, yeah, probably the, the best achievement that I, I made was the, the final, the world championship and the final at the Olympics. I was in both of those races. Um, and I will say I did my first international team that I ever made. So competing for us was the Pan American games in Rio de Janeiro. Oh, look at that. <laughs> We're here in Brazil. Okay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So of all the things that you've said, I, I want to kind of go back because uh, being that this is for my students, you mentioned varsity team mm -hmm. and um, we don't have that down here. Okay. So uh, that's one thing I want to ask you about is uh, varsity. Um, you talked about, okay, the different companies and stuff, so the, 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 you know, Adidas and Reebok, so that's cool. Um, and ah, and then I, I remember reading that in 2011, you were like the first woman since 1985 to be ranked number one, the first American woman to be ranked number one in the That's 1500 right. meters. That's quite something. I know. I didn't remember the year. And it's I, funny because actually it was just like maybe a year or two after that, Jenny Simpson, I think, was number one. So, but it just, it didn't sound as, as cool because I was like, it was like, oh, well, two years ago, another American woman was number one. <laughs> but still, I mean, that's, that's a huge, I mean, Jesus, you know. I know. <laughs> um, so, okay, so let's backtrack a little bit just to some basic stuff and, you know, we'll edit this later. So okay. uh, you, you talked about making the varsity team uh, at Cornell and the first year you didn't make the varsity team, you were adjusting. Uh, what does that mean to make a varsity team? And maybe if you could get into um, uh, a little bit about, you know, Cornell's being a Division One school and there's Division Got Two, and three. maybe explain a little bit about the the relationship between athletics and education and the higher higher education. Got it. Okay, so I guess you know to start off with, Cornell was a Division One school, which means like the Division One is kind of like the the top tier. Um, in terms of like all the kind of big um, 
bigger schools that are more well known for sports are division one. And then some of the smaller schools are division two. I believe there's division three. And then there's also, there's like a last level and I forget what it's called. It's do you remember? Community college sort of thing. I don't know. I know there's one, two, and three for sure. Right. And then there, it, it has like a whole other name where it's not even division something. It's like another name. But yeah, I can't remember. So a lot of division one schools give scholarships. So you can get basically your schooling paid for to compete as an athlete for that school. So even though Cornell is division one, because we are an Ivy League school, there's a small group of schools where they don't pay scholarships for athletics. So um, they give you some financial aid for academics, but not for athletics, because it's a primarily, it's more known for an, for being academic. Um, whereas a lot of other division one schools, you can get your entire schooling paid for. Um, so that, that means you're just competing against some of the best athletes in the country at the division one schools. So right. we are division one. And then for the track team, uh, basically if you tried out for the team, almost everyone was able to be on the team. Um, what divided varsity or not is if you were good enough to get points for the team. So say you were at a competition with another school and if you ran well and placed high consistently and scored points for your team, then you would be a varsity member of the team, okay. essentially. Great summary, that was great. Okay, perfect, nice, short and sweet and clear. So yeah, so we don't have that here in Brazil. This is another topic which we don't have to get into, but a lot of people are interested in it um, because Brazil obviously has very strong athletics for, for yeah. volleyball and for soccer specifically, uh, but it's not a part of any academic institution, really. Right, I mean, right. Colleges have teams, but they're like clubs. Club teams, yep. So it's a different structure, and um, in my opinion, it's... I think Brazil would benefit from um, a, 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 like a, a marriage between the academic and the athletic system. Um, yeah. I actually have this thing that's like, well, you come from soccer, right? Didn't you play basketball. soccer? Oh, basketball. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I was going to say, you know, I think that soccer players, uh, a lot of soccer players could probably transition it into, into running because, I mean, the midfielders, you know, a good yeah. mid midfielder can run, you know? For sure. So I always thought it'd be interesting, see, being that so many people have the dream of being a professional soccer player, of maybe designing some sort of system, <laughs> obviously this is dreaming, to funnel like the guys that maybe aren't so hot at soccer, but they can really run and maybe right. train them for athletics. But anyway. It's, yeah, I think there are a lot of runners who played soccer when they were younger. Um, and it makes sense. Yeah, like you said, it's, it's very similar in terms of endurance and speed and, and all that. Right, right. Um, but okay, so we talked about the varsity thing. Now there was no scholarships. It, it, being that you know you had a, so, doing so well, uh, it wasn't attractive to go to a school that maybe would pay for everything. Or or did they? Did you get a, you know? I guess you could have ran anywhere and probably gone for free, right? In in college. Yeah. So in high school, I wasn't. I was like, okay, but I wasn't great at running. Like I, my first love is basketball. So I spent all my time trying to go pro in basketball and I just like happened to be good at running. So I did visit some of those bigger schools and I could have received like a partial scholarship. So say if I got half my schooling paid for at one of those bigger schools, it ended up being about the same as the financial aid I received from Cornell. So it, it, and at the end of the day, I, I just wasn't going to turn down an Ivy League education. Right, 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 yeah. right, right. Understandable. Um, okay, so then getting on to, and what about that transition, I guess? You know, you said that you weren't doing that hot, and then all of a sudden, kind of, you're just, you know, killing it. So how did that, was it like, wow, I'm surprised? Or was it like, oh, yeah, I'm finally doing what I always thought I could do? I think more surprise for sure. You know, I think I was from like a pretty small town in Northern Indiana. And this is like before also there was a lot of social media and a lot of like, I didn't know what other people were doing all over the country or world. So now I think when you're younger, you just, you kind of, if you have access to the internet, you know what people are doing if you're interested in it. So I think it was kind of nice that I just didn't know that I wasn't as good as a lot of people, and I just kind of took my time to develop. Um, but I would say after college, 
I went to Michigan and, you know, was part of, um, I didn't, I worked out with like some college kids that were like a lot better than I was. And then after that, I, um, moved to California and joined a new team and under my coach there, Terrence Mahan, he just like, basically was like such a great coach. And I learned so much from him that I just like really developed into more than I really ever thought I would. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That makes me think of two things. Um, I'm just going to, before I forget, so coaching. Um, so I had read, I had read uh, at one point an article about a woman, a girl, a college girl who went to run for Nike. And she kind of just was like, thought it was awful, the experience. Is this and Mary so, Kane? Is that I'm right? Sorry? Was her name Mary? Mary Kane? Maybe, maybe. I don't okay. remember a while ago. But um, so I wanted to, it sounds like your experience was much different. It sounds like a positive experience, right? Yeah, for sure. You know, I think, also, I think for me, you know, after I went pro, I still like was, I was basically being coached by a college coach and, you know, his first priority was his college team and the us pros were kind of secondary. Um, but it's like anything, I guess really what I'm trying to say is like, we just, I always had like a supportive system where my coach was obviously concerned about, you know, my diet and, um, my health and well being, but it was all in like a very supportive way, not like only about performance. Like he cared about me as a person and what my life would be after running and, you know, building character, not just performing. So I think that's where this girl, I think if it's the same girl I was talking or thinking about, she basically went from high school to professional running and she didn't have a lot of that like college or more time to like develop. And she was just like pretty influential, I think, and a lot of pressure. I see. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Okay. So, some other questions that I have here from students and stuff. Um, uh, you you talked about diet. That's one. I mean, how how important was that to your success? Uh, I mean, is it pretty rigid, or is it kind of just like I'm still eating hamburgers, pizzas? And- yeah, I think honestly, um, I'm not someone who has any dietary restrictions in terms of allergies or anything like that. So really, what I have been kind of taught my whole life and still abide by is just moderation for everything so you know even when I was like the the day that I won the diamond league it was in Brussels and so I basically like if I won this race I was going to win the diamond league so it was like a really important end of my season race and like that morning I remember like walking around Brussels and I ate like one of those waffles with like some of the chocolate on it because like at that point you know I was like I was in such good shape and I knew that you know, if I had lived 85% of my diet was, you know, healthy and pretty strict that like the 15% wasn't going to make a difference. Like it's important, I think, to like have those indulgences and kind of listen to your body. So, and I still like, I had a great race. It's not like I ate it right before I ran, but you know, I was like, this is okay. It's, it's still like energy and nutrients for my body and my soul. So it worked out. (laughs) Fantastic. Okay, cool. Cool. And um, because, you know, uh, we see these pictures of you and you're just like, ah, <laughs> you're a strong woman. You're a strong woman. You're a lean woman. Um, so, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, uh, I was looking at the pictures with, with Deborah. And she's like, wow, this woman's kind of <laughs> crazy, you know? <laughs> I know. Well, we do also, and that was an important part of our training was lifting weights. So it's like, we didn't just run like twice a week. We were in the gym lifting weights and other days we'd be working on like plyometrics, which is like jumping and things like that. So there was, there was still a lot of weight training and not only concerned about running. They had to go together. Right, right, right. Okay. Um, and then just the question, let's see, I got some things here. Ah, the degree of discipline. I mean, is it like, you know, what's the, is it stressful or is it pleasurable? The training regimen, uh, what's that feel like? Yeah. You know, I think it really depends on your personality. Like I personally, and someone who kind of needs structure. So, you know, having like 
we met almost every day for practice and my coach would write down which exercises I had to do afterwards. So like having a format to follow for me was really important. I think because it gave me a way to kind of compartmentalize stress and be like, okay, don't freak out. Just do these things. Even before a race, you know, try not to get too much in your head and be like, okay, an hour before I'm going to start my 20 minute jog and then I'm going to do my drills. So you just have to kind of, for me, I had to just take it one step at a time and just focus on one element at a time rather than being like, Oh my God, I have this big race and what am I going to do? It's like, you just, you keep things the same every time. Oh, really? Yeah. But yeah, exactly. And, And there's some people who I know that are, they're like the type of people that thrive on almost like chaos where, so say like you're, you arrived late, to the arena but like for me that would have been really stressful but for some people they're like it's fine they like they get amped up and it and it drives them more so you know i think it just kind of depends on your personality type for sure i mean i'm wondering here i mean what what was your first like big what would you think was your first time when when you step on the track and you're like holy moly you know i'm I'm like with the best in the world here what was that what was that first race so i'd say one of my agent who um he put on a, a diamond league which i forget at the time it was called something it was like world cup or something it had changed names but it's basically there's a series of races all over the world that are like the best races and it's where you make the most money and you get points where you can like win overall titles and and everything so my agent had puts on one of those meets every year And normally this is a race that I wouldn't have been able to get into because I just wasn't, it was early in my career and I wasn't good enough yet. But because he was my agent, he was able to get me a a spot in the race. Uh And, you know, they're, they're going down the line, like in lane one, here's so-and-so who was a world champ. And then here's the Olympic medalist from two years ago. And and then they get to me and they're like, and a Cornell graduate who hasn't done anything yet. So that was a bit humbling to, to realize that like, wow, I'm around some athletes who have accomplished a lot and just, you know, hoping for the best. <laughs> and how did it go? How did that one go? Um, you know, I think I, I probably surprised myself. I don't think, I think I was probably like in the mix. I don't think I was last, but I certainly didn't win. I just kind of like, I still ran an okay race, yeah, but yeah. it was more of a stepping stone than anything. Sure. Sure, sure. And then you kind of got used to that process. You're going, you're showing up in Brussels, you're showing up in uh, in Rio, you're showing up at the Pan Am Games. And then, are you? I I guess you get to a point where you're just feeling confident. Are you going in and thinking like, I'm going to win this race, or is it like, I'm I I have jitters? You you definitely got to a point where you're out there. You're like, I'm going to win this thing, right? Yeah, right. So I think it depends. You at various points in my career, I would have felt either of those things. And I think, you know, the Olympic year was always like a, an interesting in terms of the sense, like when I was in the final at the Olympics, you know, I walk out and there's like tens of thousands of people cheering. And it's, you know, this is like the moment that I've like waited for my whole life. Like I was less nervous for that race than it was like, maybe like my high school state championship meet, because I knew that I had like, I had put in all the work um, everything leading up to that, I had competed in the rounds really well. Um, and I was just really confident in my ability. So like, I remember thinking like, even during the race at the, at the last lap, I was like, Oh, I'm going, like, I'm going to medal, medal. Like, I feel great. Like, and then I fell and it was like a different story, but <laughs> at the yeah. time, you know, I was like, I was like, Oh, I feel great. So yeah, sometimes I think when you had, I just, when you, um, are confident in what you've done, you feel more confident. But when you're kind of like, oh, maybe earlier in the season, you don't know where your fitness is yet and you get more nervous when you just don't know. Okay. Yeah, and then the, the, you know, obviously I, I, I heard about it and I saw it and I, I felt, oh, I felt the <laughs> terrible work. I don't want to bring it up because I, I must oh. just- <laughs> Oh, it's been a long, it's been long enough now, I don't mind. <laughs> yeah, oh, but I mean, uh, yeah, because I, 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 and I don't remember all the details, but I just, I just, I, I think it was, you know, you're at the prime, right? You were, you were totally prepared and able to, like you said, to, to meddle. So it's just, uh, you know, it's too bad that that happened. And, uh, 
Uh, yeah, so, but I guess overcoming that, like, you know, you're just like, all right, on to the next thing. What what was the attitude that you had to take? What, did you, what was the takeaway? Yeah, you know, I think it definitely, the, it was challenging mentally, obviously, to overcome that. But also, like, physically, when I, when I fell, I had, like, I had already had, like, a little bit of an injury going in that I was, like, holding together. And then after I fell, like, I had, like, hurt my back. So then I, I think I didn't race anymore that season. I think I was just like, I'm just going to take my break, shut it down, and just, like, refocus for next year. Right. Um, and honestly, like, I really, I'd say I probably didn't really, it took me, like, several years to, like, get back into, like, good racing shape. Like, probably the year I retired, I my times were, like, good again, and I was running well. But I don't, like, I don't know, except that might not have been, like, I didn't think it was because of the Olympics. I think it was just, you know, we all have um, waves and, you know, peaks and valleys of, of performance. And I just, like, wasn't performing as well after that for a few years. Right, right, right. Oh, man, that's too bad. Yeah. But, I mean, but in the whole general context, I mean, you had a lot of just huge victories. And, uh, I mean, just being there is... Exactly. Uh, I mean, that's just, like, incredible, you know? Exactly, I mean, yeah. At the end of the day, it was still, like, an amazing experience that a lot of people don't get to experience. So yeah. it was it was amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, okay, so let's see here. Um, ah, then things related to travel and language. Maybe mm -hmm. not so much. The, I mean, you know, you're around international athletes. I don't know, are you talking to these people? Or are there any funny stories about, you know, communication issues, anything like that? Yeah, I'd say that's one of the, you know, great things about track is, you know, because of the travel, you do get to meet and see like amazing places that otherwise I probably never would have visited. Um, so a lot of times when you travel to a race, the race has like a hotel where all the athletes stay. So basically all the athletes like you're going to the same track to practice and you're, you know, you're eating meals in the same area so you you are able to like interact with people and if you if you a lot of athletes tend to go to the same races so sometimes you just end up traveling almost to the same races with a lot of the same people so you end up getting to like know them a little bit or um at least like seeing them so you know there's a mix because some of them are your competitors so i wouldn't say i'm necessarily or even with like a language barrier it, they might not speak english or i don't know their language so, but you still you know, get to acknowledge the other person and, um, you know, also speaking with some people who from maybe some European countries that do know English or, or whatever. So, um, yeah, it's a great way to, to, to meet people and see places that otherwise maybe I never would have seen before. So I see. Uh, but like, um, I don't know. I don't know. I guess so you go to the event. And is everything in English? Like if you're in Brussels or if you're in Rio, is everything in English? Or? So most of the time, I would say like at a lot of the, the the smaller meets, a lot of them would be in their in the host country's language. And a lot of the bigger Diamond League meets, you know, I feel like it was mostly English. But now I can't even remember because it's all now like jumbling in my brain. I see. You're probably just focused on what you need to do, right? So Yeah, because, you know, I think, <laughs> I mean, I would say like, obviously, like we're, as Americans, we're very fortunate that a lot of people know English. So I don't know if it's just like my brain thinking that. It was all in English. Uh, yeah, but it would be interesting because like, you know, a lot of athletes, I think, would they, for them, it was fun to like, they wanted to practice their English or they wanted to just like kind of learn things. So like they would want to talk to you just to kind of, really? you know, kind of try it out, which was kind of fun. So oh, that's cool. Yeah. Cool. And just, I just out of curiosity, I mean, who, in, in, in terms of your, you know, other athletes that you like, who is the most like, uh, I don't know, not the most famous, but the most, like, an athlete that you met that you were like, wow, this is, I don't know, I don't know if you met, like, uh, these guys, like, checked a guy that are running today, or, or uh, was that other guy, uh, Kipchoge, you know, the marathon guy, I don't know, or Usain Bolt, I don't know, or some women, uh, the, the, recently, the, 
5K record was broken by that Ethiopian woman. I forget her name now, but did you meet any of these characters? Yeah, so not the marathon, not the like the marathon runners so much, but um, like Usain Bolt and I, we competed at the same time. So like, not that I really like met him, but it was just great because any meet that he was at was automatically better. Like there was more fans, like he's just a very charismatic figure. So like every race that he was at, that I was at, it was just like automatically like a more fun experience. Um, a woman that I competed against a lot who has only now just gotten better and better is Safan Hassan. So she is, I think, Ethiopian, but competes for Holland. Like she, right? I think that, yeah, she competes for Holland. So she, like, I think has, I mean, she's been destroying, like, she ran, I don't know if it was any world records, but um, she's been, like, just crushing everyone now and i it's just funny because i used to beat her like quite a bit and now that would not be the case at all <laughs> yeah yeah you know, i i know who you're talking about yeah and she's 1500 100 meter runner right yeah so, but she also she kind yeah, of yeah exactly yeah yeah I know she's very talking. like tall and like small but it's just like a powerhouse on the track uh, i see i see you know i got a question because i've been watching more and more track and field obviously you know I'm, uh, I love watching it, and um, I think it's a beautiful sport. Just that, That's why, you know, I look at you guys running, and you just go, and, and it's, it looks so controlled, so calm. I think like there's got to be something zen. I mean, obviously, <laughs> I competed, but I've never competed at that level, and I just feel like that you got to get some sort of zen in your mind just to, I don't know. I, yeah. Fantasize. Yeah. I think so, and I think it doesn't really matter, like, what level you compete at. I think, like, even if you're in high school or younger, you know, I think, it's important to find that kind of mental aspect of any sport. Like the mental aspect is just as important as the physical aspect. I think it's just that as we get older, we can tap into that part a little more easily, or we realize that it is important. Sure, sure, sure. Um, and let's see, there's a few things. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I'm liking the conversation. How are you doing with time? You got to. Yeah, I'm doing good. All right. Good. Thanks. Okay, so uh, travel language, cool. Talk a little about Usain and Hassan. That's interesting. Ah, so I was going to say, so I've been watching athletics or track and field, and now they got these, like, track, like, pace things. Yeah. I'm curious about your opinion about that. I mean, I feel like it, it also seems like there's a lot of world records just being, like, contested recently. I'm wondering, what do you attribute that to? What's going on? Is, you know, is it technology? Is it? Yeah, honestly, I think a lot of it is technology. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I think, you know, from the the beginning of any sport, there's been technological advances. But the shoes have been a big, a big controversy. You know, Nike was the first company to come out uh, with like a carbon plate. And what that does is it's a, it has a higher energy return. So like literally now every other shoe company has come out and they're playing catch up with these carbon plated shoes. So like my fellow, um, the team that I help coach, they just got their shipment of these shoes. And literally they say that it feels like it pushes you forwards. It's like, it's like having a spring in your shoe is what they say. Really? So yeah. So like basically now, like, you know, our governing body has had to try to decide what to do with these shoes. Like they, they have to like, basically somehow they limit how high the shoe can be and what amount of, you know, foam versus carbon plate or something. So they're trying to level the playing field. But like you said, there's already been so many world records. And I think a lot of it is because of the shoes. Uh -huh. um, but also, yeah, when the, I haven't ever competed in something that had, I think the line going around the track, it's more recent. Um, but a lot of races I competed in had what's called a rabbit. So what that is, is say that there's a person in the race where, their main job is to go to the front of the race and they're to run a certain pace. So instead of you leading and maybe having to deal with the wind or things, there's someone in front and you just follow them. And then the rabbit at some point will pull off the track and everyone else keeps going. Um, so in, in, in my mind, it's kind of the same thing where even though there's a light on the track, like you physically still have to chase that light. Like there's, there's nothing helping you. It's just like more of a mental assistance i guess but yeah there's always there's a lot of changes 
going yeah. on. I think maybe some for better, some for worse. I don't, I don't really know. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Okay. And then um, I, I also read a little bit that you know, there's like this whole gender issue going on. Um, yeah. Uh, and affecting athletics because, you know, you have in here in Brazil, it's, you know, you have, I think there's a man that, you know, had became a woman and he is a professional volleyball player. And then got you, got, you got other situations like Castor from South right. Africa, who she is a woman. She hasn't done any, you know, as far as I know, any right. genetic or whatever changes or not genetic changes, uh, physical changes, let's say, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but she has a hormonal profile that's apparently different from other women. So, I mean, and, and these are things that are happening recently. It's like, it's like, what, what's your opinion on that? Do you, I mean, do, I guess what I had read is that she should reduce her hormone levels to average levels. And what comes to my mind, it's like, well, what if this has always been the case or, or not always been, you know what I'm saying? I'm sure this is sure. the first time that this happens just now that we have the science to sort of, so I don't know. Do you think? What's your opinion on that? Oh man, yeah, it's such a it's such a hard topic. It's one of those things where I feel like it there's like there's not really a right answer. It's like choosing the best of like just kind of bad options all around. Yeah. Um, in terms of like Castor Semenya specifically, you know, it's like her higher levels of testosterone like absolutely give her an advantage. But like, that's her natural body. She's not cheating. Like there's, she never has like cheated. And I think it's unfortunate that she should be punished for something that she she's can't. just, she's competing with the, the body that she was born with. Um, but it is hard because it is an advantage. But I would say that like, you know, her career is limited. She's not gonna be competing forever. And there's, there's people who are cheating and they don't get always caught, so. Um, yeah, I definitely think that she should be allowed. Um, in terms of the, the testosterone, it's like, I, I understand that like reducing it to levels, like part of me sees the benefit of that, but also you're asking her to alter her natural state yeah. and that, that just seems wrong. <laughs> so I, mean, I don't want to simplify it too much, but I kind of feel like it's like, you know, what if you're really tall and you want to play basketball and it's like, you know, it's, it's like you can't, you know, you can't control the fact that you're taller than everybody or whatever. So, yeah, I, it's similar. It's like she can't really control her chemical or her um, uh, physiology, right? So, right. I know. I do think that there's a difference between being tall. I think there is a difference between like a, a horn. And because I've had this conversation with, with a, sorry, I'm just plugging my computer in so my battery doesn't. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Oh, do you want to? I like that painting, by the way, that you have there on your wall. Oh, that one over there? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I like both of them. Yeah, you guys got, I like those colors. Yeah. I've been painting, so I, I, I've been, you know, oh, painting a little bit. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. But, um, but yes, it, I think it's a, it's a really challenging issue that deserves, you know, all the attention it's getting because it's, it's something that's not going away, obviously. Right, and they right. need to kind of figure out, I think, um, what to do moving forwards. Yeah. All right. Well, look, um, I think I, I've touched on all the topics that I wanted to kind of touch on. What I'm, I'm imagining doing in the course is, you know, we brought up some athletes. So probably, you know, I edit it, put a photo of the athlete. I don't know if you mind if I use photos of you or video. Yeah. No problem. No worries. That's, that's totally fine. So, and, and this is going to take a while to actually create that, but I'm, I'm trying to get the content now. So one, once I have it ready, I'll, I'll send it to you and you can give me your thumbs up and stuff like that. Oh, okay. Cool. Okay. Um, and uh, I guess, um, no. yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I guess, well, the last thing that we, we did not record is now you're uh, working for the Boston Athletics Association, right? That's right. Yeah. I know. I got my little... BAA yeah. unicorn right there. Yeah, and just quickly, uh, if you want to just tell us really quickly about that, you know, the Boston Marathon and all that kind of stuff. 
Yeah. So the BAA has been around, gosh, I can't remember how long, but the, the it, it's kind of interesting because the BAA started and like their main goal was like as an organization is they had athletes competing and they always wanted athletes to go to the Olympics. So the BAA itself had some athletes they like sponsored, I guess, go to the Olympics. Like, I mean, like the forties or something like a long time ago. Um, so ever since then, you know, they've had, you know, they started the Boston Marathon and they have other road races in the area, but now they have within the last five years restarted their high performance team with the hopes of getting, um, more athletes back to the Olympics, which is something that they haven't done, like probably since <laughs> the forties or something. So, um, I get to work as an assistant coach and try to help those athletes accomplish that. Fantastic. Fantastic. Cool. And are you running? Are you running at all? Or are you just Yeah, so I still run. I mean, I would say like very currently I kind of injured myself during the pandemic. So I've been I was cycling a bunch and then somehow my dog, I don't know if you've had this experience where my dog was like pulling the lead it, like she ran on the leash and it like jerked and it twisted oh. my knee <laughs> somehow. Ooh. Oh so God. now I have like a knee injury because of my dog. So dog. <laughs> she's only 24 pounds. So I'm not sure how that happened. Yeah, we well, were getting older. I noticed like oh little things are just turning my body. I'm like, oh my God, my knee, what's happening? You know, so. I, right. I know. I wasn't going to say it, but you're right. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, Morgan, uh, really great catching up with you. I appreciate you taking the time on a Sunday to chat with me. Yeah, thanks so much. I hope uh, hope you get some good stuff out of this. <laughs> definitely, definitely, definitely did. And it was good to see you. And I wish you well and all the stuff that you're up to and, and your family and everything. And uh, I'll, I don't know, maybe we'll be in touch on Facebook or something like that. Hey, that sounds great. And all the best to you also. Thanks. See you, Morgan. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah.